Jeremiah chapter 49. We're coming to the end of Jeremiah. Concerning the Ammonites. Now that's the other son. Of, yeah, the other son of Lot. We've already talked about Moab in chapter 48. Has Israel no sons? Has he no heir? Why then does their king inherit Gad and his people dwell in his city? What they're doing is they're going in the land of Israel and taking over. Israel does have sons. They're not gone. They're not been uh, done with. Ammon thinks they have. Therefore, behold, the day has come, saith the Lord, that I will cause an alarm of war. Alarm. Sounds, the news, the threat, to be heard in Reba of the Ammonites. And it shall be, des be a desolate heap, no one there. A heap, again, you'll find when you look at uh, maps today, Tell. T-E-L or T-E-L-L. -L. What it is, is just a city built upon a city, a town built upon a, to a town. Just a big mound of dirt. And what's under those dirts are, are other cities. And her daughters shall be burnt with fire, destroyed. Like Judah was destroyed, Jerusalem was destroyed. Everything wood burnt up. Everything that could be burned with fire burnt up. Then shall Israel be hair unto them that were his hair, saith the Lord. So Israel is going to get the land back. They just been put in captivity for their sins. God's not done with them. Problem is the enemy has moved in. The enemy says, oh, now I'll occupy. How, O Heshbon, for Ai is spoiled. Cry ye, doors of Reba, gird you with sackcloth. And that's a sign of mourning. That's a sign of, I'm in trouble. That's a sign of, we need help. That's a sign of, uh, oh, just itching. That's what because sackcloth is. It's, oh, it's something you, you're not going to desire. You will not go into a clothing store and find sackcloth clothing. You'll find it on potato. Lament, lament, and run to and fro by the hedges. Go anywhere, anywhere you can. But you're not going to go through the hedges. For their king shall go into captivity, and his priests and his princes together. Gone. You don't mess with Israel. And I, we're not turning against the God of the Bible. We're turning against the people of God in the Bible. The ones that Genesis 12 said, I will curse them that curse you. Ammon and Moab are enemies of the Jews, along with everybody else who's around them. you got to realize, when you look at a map of Israel, and you see all around them, they're kin. By Abraham, by Lot, by Abram. They're kin. And they hate that one relative, Israel. Wherefore, glorious thou in the valleys, the flowing valley, O backsliding daughter, that trusts in her treasures. Look what money we have. Look what gold we have. Look what treasure we have. Look what gems we have. What jewels we have. Saying, who shall come unto me? Who, who's who's going who's gonna to get rid of us? Who, who's going to battle us? Who, who's going to get us? I mean, we're in the valleys. We can see if somebody's coming. Believe it or not, a valley has a, has a great advantage point when it comes to wartime. You can see them coming. Behold, I will bring a fear upon thee. Anxiety. Saith the Lord God of hosts. For all those that be about thee. And ye shall be driven out every man right forth. You're leaving. And none shall gather up him that wandered. And afterwards I will bring again the captivity of the children of Ammon, saith the Lord. So there's going to be a captivity. There's going to be a taking. There's going to be death. But Ammon's coming back. Concerning Edom. Now that's Esau. That's their brother. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Is wisdom no more in Teman? Is counsel perish from the prudent? Is there wisdom vanished? Where, where, where's your knowledge? Where's your wisdom? Where's your understanding, Edom? Edom is Esau, the Bible will tell you. 
Flee, turn back, dwell deep. Oh, what happened is a D Dan. For I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him. The time that I will visit him. That's not the visitation you want. Dwell deep is into the caves. If grape gatherers come to thee, will they not leave some gleaning, some gleaning grapes? I mean, you're not going to gather all the grapes. You're going to leave some behind. If thieves by night, they will destroy till they have enough. They're going to keep thieving. They're going to keep, keep killing. They're going to keep breaking doors. They're going to keep breaking windows until they've had enough spoil where they, they just can't carry anymore. But I have made Esau bare without anything. I have uncovered his secret places. Well, not just naked. It says places. They're safes. They're depositories. Them themselves, yeah. It's all going to be found out. And he shall not be able to hide himself. That's going to be bad. I mean, there are some good hiding places. You, you build a bomb shelter and all that. And God says, it's going to be found. Do you realize how many Jews hid and were still found in World War II under Hitler? You know how many people turned them in? You know what Edom does? I believe it's Obadiah. And forgive me if I'm wrong. But it reads account when, when Nebuchadnezzar comes into Babylon, they grab Jews and turn them over to, ba to Babylon, the king of Nebuchadnezzar. Here, here's some Jews we found running into our country. Take them. Edom is not going to escape. They're going to be paid. Hey, I saw an Edomite. Hey, here's a child of Esau. How much will you give me for him? That's what it's talking about. Just watch what it says. He shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled. That is his, his children. And his brethren. That's his family. And his neighbors. And he is not. Everything about him. What is it going to be Edom? What is it going to be Esau? He's the one that sold it all out for beans. Beans. That's it. That was his whole life. Beans. If he, if he didn't have the beans, he was going to die. Leave thy fatherless children. You know what a fatherless child has? I'll give you I'll give you one give you one clue what a fatherless child does not have. He does not have a father. There are a bunch of people today that we were talking about somewhere with but there's children who have no dad. Why? Deaf, don't care. No one to help the wife, the mother. No one to be the standard in the family. No one to, to stand up for with God and his family. They are without protection. You think a, you think a woman back in these days was going to be able to protect herself? They were delicate and, and fine women that mind the kitchen. They weren't brutes like they are today. And when the father was gone, there was no income. And then the creditors would come. Then the taxpayer. Listen, uh, Elijah, Elijah dealt with a widow woman. They had a couple of sons and with the oil. Why was the oil? Because there was no more money coming in. They were not hired a woman. There was no equal rights opportunity to women in race. I will preserve them alive and let thy widows trust in me. So there's hope. God stands up for widows in the Bible. Can you name a famous widow in the Bible that held the Lord Jesus Christ in her arms? Anna. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, they whose judgment was not to drink the cup have assuredly drunk it. Now this cup here is a cup of judgment that the nations slowly fill up. And they fill up with their sin. They fill up with their filthiness. They fill it up with their iniquity. And when it starts spilling over, your cup runneth over. Then God pours it out and says, drink it. Be not deceived. God is not marked. Whatsoever man soweth, that he shall reap. You wait to see what these children are growing up today under our government. 
You wait to see when they're adults. I thank God I will be definitely in heaven by that time. You give these children 20, 30 years. I, may, I may live that long, but give them time to be in the... Listen, the, the people that are in the White House, the people that are on Capitol Hill right now in my time and age were the ones that were partying at Woodstock. Of course marijuana is legal now. They were smoking it when they were teenagers. And if they make it legal, guess what they're still doing on Capitol Hill? For thus saith Lord, Behold, they whose judgment was not to drink of the cup has surely drunk it. It was not to drink the cup. And art thou he that shall altogether go unpunished? There were people that drank your cup of judgment. And guess what? You think you're not going to drink it? You know how many nations God has destroyed since Adam? And you think God's going to say, oh, America? Oh, it's okay. You're a fine Christian nation. I'll let you go. Here, get out of the cup. Get out of the judgment. Get out of hell free card. Okay, America? I don't think so. I think America will stand more to judgment than out of Hitler. More than the Russians, more than the Tsars, more than the kings, more than all the history tyrants. Why? Because America had a Bible. You know, I don't know if I can say this. I don't know how to say it. I don't know if it should be said, but I, I like to live daily experience. There was a time you can go to Walmart and find a King James Bible. You can't today. Well, I'm not going to say that. Go unpunished. Thou shalt not go unpunished. But thou shalt surely drink of it. This nation has caused other people to suffer. And God says, you're going to get it. You know how many people suffer in America today? I mean, not, not just America and Americans suffer. I mean, talk about people worldwide. There are people trying to live an honest business life, and they can't do it today. There are people trying to, to trying to live out the Bible and, live, and trying to live out God, and they can't do it. There are people trying to do what God told them to go and all you preach the gospel in a free nation of a constitution that says we have a right to, to, to speak freedomly, and yet you can't. And you can't speak up against a sinner's. And condemnation and abomination that God speaks of, you can't speak against them. Wait till they have their day of judgment. Wait till when you've got these marriages now going on that God has blasphemy, God has, has damned. Wait till you find out when their sexual diseases start spreading. And Obamacare won't be able to take care of them. You wait till these people that get in these medical fields start realizing the disease are going to happen and start falling out by the wayside. Because, listen, there are already people right now that are falling out of the medical field because of all the stuff they do to protect the sinners. For I have sworn by myself, saith the Lord. Oh, here's God saying an oath by himself. That Basra. You know what's funny? I come from Connecticut and I remember a town named Basra. Basra is an Esau Edomite city that God said, I'm going to judge. I'm finding cities in, in Connecticut called Bethlehem, Jerusalem, any good cities of the Bible, and there's a Bethel. Basra shall be a desolation, destroyed, gone, ruined, heat. A reproach, a waste, a dump, <laughs> and a curse. You know, God never wastes anything. Well, here he's going to turn this place into a waste. He's going to make it a dump. And all cities thereof shall be a perpetual waste. Shall be a forever dump. I have heard a rumor from the Lord. <laughs> Imagine the Lord telling the rumor. And an ambassador is sent unto the heathen, Gentiles, saying, Gather ye together and come against her, and rise up to the battle. For, for lo, I will make thee small among the heathen, 
and despised among men. Thy terribleness has deceived thee, and the pride of thy heart. Oh, look at that pride, just like Moab. You can never find pride with God, and no Christian should ever say, I'm proud. No Christian should ever say pride. I know it slips out. We say it. You know what God says? Well done. You should never say, I'm proud of my son. I'm proud of my wife. I'm proud of my daughter. I'm proud of whoever. It's not a godly Bible term. I, I know I, We mean well. But let's start using the Bible word. I had somebody the other day I, I was dealing with. He says, well, we don't talk this Elizabeth English. Well, we ought to. We ought to be putting more these and thys in our vocabulary at work and at the marketplace and everywhere we go. So when someone says, we don't use Elizabeth in English, well, I do. We need to learn it, and we need as Christians to bring it back, not bearing the filthy language of the world. Oh, that dwelleth in the cliffs of the rock, and the mountains, and, and good passages of rocks, caves, a stronghold. You know, that holdest the height of the hill. Though thou shouldst make thy nest as high as the eagle, mountain top. Go as high as you can, like they did in Babel. I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. That was a rumor. The Lord, the Lord's going did you hear what the Lord's going to do? The Lord's going to do it. Not a rumor. But that's what the people were treating it as. See, that's not... You know, that's not the Bible. It's wrong. God's only recording. That's what the people are saying. But God says it's going to happen. Because look what he says. Edom shall be a desolation. It's not a rumor. You know, you can say, oh, well, there is no hell. Guess what? You spread a rumor. And God heard you. For there is a hell. You want to hear people that talk rumors and say, oh, I heard a rumor from the Lord. Talk to Jehovah Witnesses. They'll tell you plenty of rumors from the Lord. And I'll back you with the Bible to tell you what's true. Everyone that goeth by it shall be astonished. Wow, look at that. Can you imagine somebody living that strong and that high? And that that army just came in and kicked butt. Silipetra. Silipetra is a very perfect city like that. That place was so protected, only one or two men could, could cut through into the entrance of that city. Yet that city lays desolate, waiting for Israel to come. Everything's been prepared for Israel. There are wells of water collecting rainwater over there. There is a fortress of stone of beyond ability. And from what I've been told, there are Jewish Bibles over there, just waiting for them. And you would think, here's this passageway, man. They could peg people off one by one, if not two by two, with arrows, with rocks. And guess what? They lost. And... Edom's going to say, hey, we got the heights. We've got the rocks. We can see them coming. We're going to throw rocks upon them. We're going to boil oil and pour it upon them. And yet God says, you're going to lose. Why? Because you put no faith in God. You know why America's going to lose? Because we're putting faith in drones and electronics. We're putting faith in electricity and batteries today. And what are you going to do if God says, okay, that's it. No more positive and negative terminal, whatever you want to call it. What if one day you're lying in bed or you're in your office and boom, there's no more electricity ever again. Big UFOs have come and stopped the electricity. Is that one of the things that the UFOs do? When they come, there's no more power, your battery dies and everything, you can't start nothing. What are you going to do with today's military when it's all push button and when you push the button, nothing happens? What are you going to do with, with your cell phone? you got all attached to you, and it don't work no more. The battery's continually forever to be dead, and you can't recharge. You're going to have to open up the sailing signs again, which are all closed. And I say that respectfully to those who are really seriously have troubles and problems. But you, today, you take away electricity, and people are just going to freak out. They're not going to know what to do. They can't cook a dinner without a microwave. They can't get a dinner. They can't start their car and go to the fast food restaurant. They wouldn't know how to start a fire if they had a book. And shall hiss at the plagues there. There's going to be plagues there. There were plagues in Egypt. 
as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. We all know the story about that. As in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the neighboring cities thereof. So it wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah. There were other cities that were destroyed. Saith the Lord, no man shall abide there. So it's empty. It's desolate. Neither shall a son of man dwell in it. No child. No grown up. Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the swelling of the Jordan against the habitation of the strong. What's that mean? Go study about lions that live in the Middle East. They got tactics that those lions do. And I've read a few books about lions. Lions have all kinds of moves. Lions will have a group of lions when you don't even know that there's a group of lions. One set of lions will be just watching. And one lion will be in charge of attacking. And when they get the meal, they all come together. Against the inhabitants of the strong. What's the strong? Living in those mountains, living in those rocks. But I will suddenly make him run away from her. The lion. Check out, check out the her lion when you do your study. And who is the chosen man that I may appoint over her? For who is like me, saith God, and who has appointed me, saith the Lord, the time? And who is that shepherd that will stand before me? For in Ezekiel 34, 11, and verse 12, that shepherd the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the shepherd. Therefore hear the counsel of the Lord, that he that taketh against Edom, and his purposes, this is this, that he has purpose against the inhabitants of Teman. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their habitation desolate with him. It's gone. That's it. People gone. You know, even at the rapture, it won't be a desolation. When we go up, there's still going to be people here. Matter of fact, I think when the rapture happens, I don't think there's going to be many alive Christians that are going to be taken up. I don't think, I think we're going to get to the point in America that's going to be like Noah and Lot and Abraham and Jeremiah. Not going to be that many. Jesus only had 12 men follow him his whole entire life. And one of them was the, was the devil. Study them disciples. Study how many were at the cross. Study how many believed the resurrection. Study how many of them doubt the resurrection. The earth is moved at the noise of their fall. Earthquake maybe. At the cry, the noise thereof was heard in the Red Sea. In the Red Sea. Well, something about this earth is going to... And Edom is above Moab, which is above the Red Sea. Some kind of quaking, some kind of cracking. Behold, he shall come up and fly as the eagle. Study an eagle. And spread his wings over Bajra, and at that day shall the heart of the mighty men of Edom be as the heart of a woman in her pangs, completely de defenseless. You realize when a woman's at that point to be get, to be delivered of a child, here she is. Say, honey, you know you know that steak and, and great dinner, that expensive restaurant that you want. Let's go now. She won't go. She can't go. She's unable to go. Pain and suffering and travail as the Bible calls it upon. Concerning Damascus. Now we're, now we're going to Damascus. You know where Paul was going. Where the news is today, Damascus. Hamath is confounded. And Arpad. For they have heard evil tidings. 
You've heard the good news? This is evil news. They are faint-hearted. Anxiety. There is sorrow on the sea. It cannot be quiet. They're weeping. Damascus is wax feeble. They're weak. Fear has seized upon her. They are weak through fear. Anguish and sorrow have taken her. There's no hope. There's no joy. As a woman in travail. Notice when the Lord wants to describe complete desolation, complete beyond recognition of being destroyed, complete uh, all of all of the nations, he always likens it to a woman giving birth to a child. How is the city of praise not left? The city of my joy. Therefore her young men shall fall in her streets. Death. How? And all the men of war shall be cut off in, the, in that day, saith the Lord. Army? Disease, killing, doesn't really say, this says the, the military men. What are the military men? The young man, the man physically strength, the man that can pick up barbells, the man that has brute strength, the man that has been trained. He's not weak, he's not feeble, but we've been reading about he is. He can't lift up his weights. He can't even fight. He is prone to die. And I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and shall be consumed the palaces of Ben-Hadad. Concerning Kedar, I believe, I think, was that the woman of uh, Song of Solomon? I think it is. And concerning the kingdoms of Hazor, with which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, shall smite, because this hasn't happened yet, at the writing. This is a prophecy. Thus saith the Lord, Arise ye, go up to Kedar, and spoil the men of the east. Their tents, that's their homes. And their flocks, that's their, that's their means of livelihood. And food, milk, wool, meat, selling, selling off a goat for property, selling off a goat for corn or whatever. Shall they take away? They shall take to themselves their curtains. And that's exactly what it is. A curtain. Room dividers in a tent. And all and probably curtains too that they use to sell. And all their vessels and their camels. That's their sedans of the desert. The ships of the desert they call. Them. And they shall cry unto them. Fear is on every you ever have this absolute fear? You know, and this is what we've been reading through this whole chapter. Fear and anxiety. You know what you cannot have when you got fear? Starts running out. You can't have faith. What did Jesus say when all those men in that boat feared? Where's your faith? You can't even have love in fear. Now, I've never really had that that amount of fear in my life, thank God. But I've had fears. But here is a fear that is just, it's from God. How are you going to escape it? When you are an enemy of God and God brings this thing upon you, and it's serious. Anxiety is very serious. And yet Jesus speaks about it in the book of Matthew. Why are you worried about what you're going to wear? Why are you going to worry about what, you, what you're going to eat? Aren't the lilies any better? Aren't the daisies in the field any better? Don't the animals, I mean the birds, don't they gather in and they don't have any storehouses? They don't have a bank and all that? What are you worried about? Be content, Paul says. Yet we all fear. But here's a fear that is God brought and without a cure. 
because you won't fear God. Flee. And I don't mean a little bug. That means run. Because of fear. You don't say, you don't sit in a, a, a stadium and, and you, they got the Olympics or they got track. You don't say, hey, there goes that number 46. Look at him flee around the track. You don't say that. Fleeing is like, you know, you go up to a hornet's nest and then you flee from the hornets. A child flees from his dad with, with a belt in his hand. You don't ever say, well, this guy is fleeing for office unless he's very much trouble. And if he gets caught in that office, he's going The suspect fled the scene. That makes news. Fleeing makes news. It's not like, oh, the owner of the store arrived at his business and opened up and went in and started. That don't make news. Get you far off. Go as far as you can. What did Jesus say to the Jews when the desolation is, is made known? Flee to the wilderness. Don't go back. Don't grab. Flee. You know why they're fleeing? Because they're nervous. They ain't running to the wilderness. They ain't running to the wilderness. All right, we're going to follow God now. No, they're fleeing. And we see a great, great definition of the word flee. Fear is on every side. Flee. O oh, inhabitants of Hazar, saith the Lord, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has taken counsel against you and has conceived a purpose against you. Arise. You're sitting down. Get you up onto the wealthy nation. Somebody's got money. Which dwells without care. They have no cares. Isn't that how the church is described in, in chapter 3 of Revel, uh, Revelation? Doesn't that sound like America? Aren't we a wealthy nation? Don't we have... Uh, all these principal uh, treasuries that our money marks offices. Don't we have Fort Knox here? Don't we have Wall Street here? Aren't we a very wealthy nation? I don't know, second none to China. That dwell without care. What cares do America have? If we can't get it, we'll credit it. And if we can't credit it, the government will give it to you. And the government can't give it to you. You can steal it. And then go to jail and get what you want in the first place. Now watch this. Saith the Lord. That's the Lord saying it. Which have neither gates nor bars. Where are the gates and bars of America? In prison, yeah. <laughs> You know, push button technologies made gates and bars are obsolete. How are you going to protect the city with walls and gates and all that when you got missiles? Yeah, but you know what gates and bars will also do? It will also keep those people out that do should or do not belong in your city. There would only be few entrances for you to go through, and you got to go through the nose of the people at the gate. If you're caught climbing over, you're going to be caught. You're going, to, you know, that's not the means to get in the city. Gates and bars are a great deterrent to crime because we're going to find out you're not allowed in our city. But here's a place that has no gates or bars, which dwell alone. Well, that's not America. We don't dwell alone, but we do have our own country, which we're allowing everybody to come in because we don't have gates or bars. You know, I wonder if the Indians had built forts and all that, how welcome we would have been. What if when the when the pilgrims came to Plymouth Rock and all that, there were Indian forts? Or down in uh, Jamestown, Virginia. What if there were forts built by the Indians? 
I don't believe the Pilgrims bought any ammunition, or I don't know. I never. But we'll move on. And their camel shall be a booty. That means a lot of camels. Camels were the transportation back then. There's a lot of cars in America. You can find them on big lots, new and used. And their multitude of their cattle as well. There's a lot of cows in America. Go to Texas. A multitude of their cow for cow a spoil to take. And I will scatter into all winds them that are in the outmost corner. You're not going to escape God. Wherever the wind is, I'm going to get you. And I will bring their calamity from all sides thereof, saith the Lord. I'm going to just bring them in, one big circle, and come and get you. I believe that was the tactic of one of the Chinese emperors. I got his name on the tip of my tongue, but I can't think of it. Very, very rough warrior, leader. And what he would do is, you'll get his name if you know what I'm talking about. He would start in an outmost case of his troops and just moving slowly and moving closer and moving closer. And listen, the animals would escape. They would let the animals escape. They just move in closer and they just move in closer until the entire army just surrounded this spot where he was supposed to be. And I've got the name on the tip of my tongue, but it won't come out. That's exactly what's going to happen here. I want to say Till the Hun, but I don't think that's the one. And Hazor shall be a dwelling for dragons, kind of lizards, and a desolation forever. There shall no man abide there. They're not going to stay there, nor any son of man dwell in it. We've already read that expression in this chapter. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam. Now we turn to Elam. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, it just gives us a date. Thus saith the Lord host, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam. That's the army. That's the strength. That's what they used as a gun back then. The bow and arrow. You know, it's not going to do you very good. You put an arrow in the, bow, in the bow and you pull it and the string goes boing. And you know what God would probably have to do to make it even funny? Have that string break and smash you right in your face. God's funny like that, you know. He had an army approach Israel one day. He sent a bunch of hornets to get them. That must have been comical. A bunch of soldiers, warriors, running from a bunch of bumblebees. I know because I've had, I've had swarms of bees attack me twice in my life. I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of their might, the chief of the chief, the marines of these guys, I'm going to destroy. The elite SEAL team, I'm going to destroy them. Won't you think that brings confidence down? When your elite soldiers are going to be brought down, what are you going to think about the guy who's peeling potatoes with KP duty? He's not going to want to stick around. Now upon Elam, will I bring the four winds, and we just read about the winds, from the four corners of heaven, north, east, south, and west. <coughs> I will scatter them toward all those winds, and there shall be no nation whether the outcast of Elam shall not come. Total. All. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before them they shall seek their life, and I will bring evil upon them, I mean, evil is the consequence of sin, remember. Remember it said, God, I created evil. It's not sin. It is because of your sin. Cancer. Because you have sinned. I'm, no, listen, I'm not talking about cancer because your body messed up. But I'm talking about a particular cancer, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, lung cancer from smoking, or a disease from improper sexual contact. That is evil, because it is the result of your sin. Evil. I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, saith the Lord. I will send a sword after them. He's going to send a sword when they got broken bows. 
A bow has better advantage over a swordman. A bow can, I don't know how far a bow can fire, but you can fire a bow a long way. You can kill the you can kill a man with a sword long before he even gets up to you. And a man with a sword, he has to come in with arm distance because that's how far his sword is in order to do the damage. But you ain't gonna kill that swordman with your with your bowls going boing boing boing. And again, it would be funny if God would smack you in the face. You know, you, you, the thing comes up, smacks you in the face, and you gotta rub your eyes. And the next thing you know, you open up your eyes. Here's a sword in your chest. You know what I mean? I will sword, send a sword out until I have consumed them. I will set my throne in Elam. Uh oh. Uh oh. That's God speaking. And will destroy from thence the kings and the princes, saith the Lord. Don't you just love chapters like this? How come you don't hear about chapter 49 be ever being taught and read in church? I've never heard a message. Jeremiah 49. Yeah, but these messages, these 39 verses can be taught about America and to repent. But it shall come to pass in the latter days that I will bring again the captivity of Elon. Elon, they're not completely done, saith the Lord. So there are going to be some places in the Bible where they're not completely destroyed, while others will be destroyed. Why? Because some will choose to fear God. The consequences, the evil that God brings upon them will be, you know, there are people I've talked to, the evil that they have done has brought them to repentance and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. A disease, a, a hospital bed, an accident. Because they were a sinner. Even because maybe they're not a sinner. This, that consequence in their life has brought them at one point in their life to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and their Savior. Oh, because, you know, many people, you, you know, Adolf Hitler, that final moment, the guy told me the other night, you know, you mean to tell me, just before he, he swallowed the bullet, whatever, how he died, from, I don't know. But before he died, if he had bent down and on his knees and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save him, he would have been saved and died and gone to heaven. I said, exactly right. Exactly right. You mean he wouldn't have to pay for all the consequences? Uh, he would lose. I don't know because you know what? At that point in his life, he would have been sinless. Wouldn't all his sins be under the blood? You read chapter 39, 49 to your average American and pray that they will take it in. We got some more. We're going to look at Babylon and Jaladin in the next chapter. If America take it in, they are sinners, and they're not because of pride. Look how lofty we dwell. That's America. There is room for repenting in this chapter, and there is room for complete, not, I can't say the word, complete destruction. We saw both. I don't think Edom's ever going to make it out because of what they've done to Israel. From their brother, I mean from their father, Esau, excuse me who is the brother of, e of Jacob. Elam, and there was another one that we read, um, Amen. Possibility, they, I will again the captivity of the children of Amen, again the captivity of Elam. You may see Edom, Edomites, or whatever they call themselves, and Ammonites. I don't think you're ever going to see an Edomite. Was Moab so, so damned? It says in the law, the Moabite, and another one, not allowed in the congregation. I have to go check that one. But, was, but Ruth was allowed in. She came to the Lord with her whole heart. Without even a witness. Naomi told her, get out of here, girl. Go back to your, no, I'm coming to you. Get out of here. You know, I don't got any more children, blah, 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 blah. Listen, I'm going to come. Your God's going to be my God. Your people are going to be my, I think, I, I think Ruth was very convinced. Somebody in that family convinced Ruth about the Lord, about, I'm going to say the Lord Jesus Christ, oh, 
Erase that one. Somebody convinced Ruth in that family about God. That she told Naomi, I don't care what you say. I don't care how you're trying to get rid of me. I'm going to go be with that God. And she is named. If not her, her husband is named in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. How's that for Moabite? And what's another thing you get out of it? There are some people out there you're going to deal with that they're going to think that their sins, they are too much of a sinner to be saved. And that's not true. That is not true. 